name's Henry Vanderbilt. I'm executive director of Space Access Society. We're more or less a single issue organization focused on radical reductions in the cost of space transportation in the relatively near term. Uh, let me get the plug in quick at the start. We do an annual conference uh, called Space Access. Uh, we run it in the Phoenix area last weekend in April every year. It's going to be in the holiday in Old Town in Scottsdale next year again last weekend in April, Thursday and then through Saturday. You can get home some weekend left for your family. Uh, if you want more information about all of that, keep track of our website, www space-access.org. I'll repeat all this at the end, too, uh, just if you missed it there. We're sort of tight for time, and I've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I'm going to be talking fairly fast and probably covering some points fairly sketchily. I'll try to give a few minutes at the end so you can ask questions if something doesn't quite make sense to you. Uh, for starters, it's impossible to talk about private ROV development isolation. And it's a bit like discussing what to do about the banana shortage while ignoring the 800-pound gorilla that's in the cage with you. Um, we've got to pay attention to the government, and for the moment, uh, the government in this instance is NASA, because under this administration, for better or worse, NASA has sole development within the government, sole responsibility with the government for our LV development. Uh, we're also probably the largest single customer for space launch in the country at the moment. Now, they have considerable influence on the question, so we're inevitably going to end up discussing NASA. Uh, I need to put in a disclaimer here. I'll be saying NASA this and NASA that, and not always nice things. Uh, I want to make it clear at the start that I'm aware that NASA is not one organization. It's a whole gaggle of organizations under one umbrella. There's a lot of good people at NASA. There's a lot of good organizations at NASA. There are a lot of good people and bad organizations at NASA still trying to do the right thing. Is that the, uh, the NASA as a whole doesn't always necessarily push in the most useful direction for our enterprises. Buzz Aldrin was referring to this yesterday when he said something to the effect that he was having a hard time getting money out of NASA to advance in the direction of lots of people, lots of ordinary people going into space as opposed to the, the, the same few people going into space. There's a specific context for that, we'll get to that later. Anyway, there are a couple of misapprehensions running around that I want to clear up at the start. You know, someone asked me yesterday, did our conference last month conclude that private reusable launch development is now impossible? Um, there was a little bit of gloom at our conference. Um, basically, what we <coughs> concluded was what we've been trying so far, uh, getting private development money for reusable launch based on the existing provable satellite market. As, as Mitch Clapp put it, competing head-to-head -head with Delta, uh, that that hadn't worked so far. Uh, the definition of sanity is when you've been trying something and it doesn't work, and you've tried it again often enough to be sure it doesn't work, you should go and try something else. And the conclusion we pretty much came to at the conference is we need to go and try and, uh, various something else's. I'll get back to all of those in a little bit. Uh, another misapprehension, and I'm afraid uh, I agree with Buzz Aldrin, in the big picture, that we need to get to a place where ordinary people can travel into space affordably, and that NASA currently is not interested in supporting that. It simply isn't something that isn't their job. And if you look at their formal charter, it's not their job. Buzz, unfortunately, had something to say about Venture Star and X-33 pretty much proving that single stage to orbit is impractical, if not impossible. We were on record early on saying that that was a distinct possibility that people would be saying that the program went the way we would thought. Uh, let me digress a bit. How many people here flew out here? Uh, packed luggage. You, you, you've been through airports before. You don't like lugging 800 pounds. You've discovered that you know that, that you really have to simplify and get on and off an airplane without you breaking your back or losing bags. Uh, keeping it simple is the essence to keep the weight down. You know, bring along a kitchen sink and the off chance the hotel won't have a sink, you assume there'll be one there. Well, in building an SSTO, uh, you need to keep it simple to keep the weight down. And the basic physics of it, of course, you're all familiar with you know, hydrogen fuel, about seven eighths of your takeoff mass is going to be propelling one eighth this structure and engines to payload everything else. Um, I'll admit the various existing proofs that rockets can be built that light. 
just to state that you do have to keep it simple and build it that light and rub it up, rub it enough to be reusable often enough to make commercial sense. Uh, what NASA did, and they bragged about it in the case of in case of X-33 is they picked a competitor that had the most structurally and technologically complex proposal. Uh, they thought this was a, a positive point in its favor. There were other reasons behind the selection, again, no time to go into details, but they did brag about picking the most complex possible uh, proposal. Oddly enough, weight's been delivered uh, to the point where it, you know, based on that vehicle alone, single stage floor it could be you know, said to look very practical. Engineers out there who probably have better ideas how to do it, they should sooner or later get a chance. But that's a bit of a sidetrack. There are other ways to get door or reuse it with a single stage. There are a lot of companies that are pursuing them. You know, just when, when you hear that X33 proves anything about the larger world, no, I'm afraid it proves a great deal about making the most complex proposal from, frankly, the contractor with the least experience with reusable uh, space vehicles at that point. The other two, respectively, uh, had recent experience building shuttle orbiters and DCX, respectively. Okay, getting back to the immediate question, why were we, why were we so gloomy at the Space Access Conference last month? Uh, the fact is that the various startups, Pioneer and Rotary and Kelly and USL, are all having problems finding private investment. Uh, the only the major company, the only companies out there, uh, well, just for may or may not have their money, money to complete development. Uh, there have been rumors around, but I haven't gotten any confirmation of that. Uh, they may have started working on their reusable two-stage vehicle. But in general, the only companies funded to go ahead with hardware development are angel funded. They're funded by you know, uh, the Beals and Bigelow's and so on. Uh, specifically, you know, Andy Beal paying to build his vehicle, which may or may not be reusable. Uh, the, problem, the problem is that the market looks at the current proven market for reusable space launch, the existing satellite market, and quite according to very basic business calculations, assumes that it's not large enough to support an investment in a new vehicle. And they're right, you know, by, by the basic business school calculations. For a while, there were a couple of years ago, we thought the market was going to barely get large enough to support a couple of such ventures and make the numbers come out and make the business plans close. That was when all the big low Earth orbit uh, communications constellations were planned. Uh, Telepisic was going to have 800 satellites, and Iridium was going to prove to everybody that the concept worked. Well, it turned out that Iridium was a turkey. Uh, and that, uh, that concept, they, they, they omitted a basic fact, a basic feature of a communication system that's going to make money in the long run. They omitted the ability to compete on volume as prices come down. And their floor price turned out to be about $1.50 a minute, absolute minimum. That's not even paying back investors. That's just ongoing maintenance costs. And their ability to increase traffic turned out not to be very large. And Iridium went belly up, and the investors concluded that there was no market. These things go in cycles. One of the, one of the other companies trying to do that sort of thing will succeed at some point. The investors will come back. But for the moment, you cannot make the case on uh, sensible business basis that the traditional market will support a reusable launch vehicle development. Okay, uh, yes, that's, there's room for a certain amount of gloom if what you've been doing for the past few years turns out to have been largely fuel. Uh, the design work that's gone into these vehicles as a fuel is still quite useful. Uh, the business plan and the attempts to get funding have basically produced a small initial uh, amounts of money to do detailed design and in the case of uh, rotary some early flight tests of the landing mode uh, but haven't come anywhere close to producing orbital flight vehicles. Uh, at that point you discover that you know, you've been taking the wrong approach trying to compete head on with Delta and you can give up. Uh, that, that was apparently what some people assumed from the tone they were hearing. Uh, what was actually spoken about, though, and I'll quote Mitch Clapp, is we must leverage off things nobody else is doing. Uh, going head to head, Delta is hindsight is, is, is a mistake. Uh, the possibilities for things that nobody else is doing, and we've discussed them endlessly, 
tourism comes to mind. There's, there's of course, the, the front end cost of getting into tourism. If you're going to carry people, your regulatory, you know, meeting the regulatory requirements are much more expensive. Uh, tourism isn't necessarily the most easy one to get into, but it is a large market you can improve. Uh, another market, a new company called Xcor, that's the, essentially the Rotary Rockets former propulsion development department, is out of Mojave right now. Originally working on developing flying replica of the X-1 rocket plane that Chuck Yeager wrote the sound barrier in, but their market research among the people who pay for things like you know old German jet, German World War II jet fighter replicas and, and, and 10 million or so a pop. There's several actually being built right now, uh, which is something I haven't been aware of. Their market research indicates that the sort of guys who have pocket money to pay for that sort of thing prefer something to carry guns. So they're currently working on a replica of the uh, Messerschmitt 163 Comet rocket fighter from World War II. Uh, slightly cleaned up and safer, slightly less explosive propellants and so on, but essentially a flyable, certifiable replica. They intend to sell this to rich schools. Uh, I understand they recently got some financing to get a little further down the road there. Right now they're working on reliable propulsion. They're going to, they're out of Mojave Airport. They, Guess that Burbutan's probably had scale composites would probably have something to do with the air, airframe. They intend to get into the space rocket business incrementally, uh, starting out with the sport rocket business. Uh, a little digression here. One of the things we came to the conclusion, one conclusion we came to is that the biggest single source of revenue for rocket uh, for, for sending rockets into space right now is television. Our reasoning is this. NASA manned space, uh, human space flight enterprise, whatever you call it, I guess manned space isn't completely correct anymore. Uh, is sending about a half dozen missions up a year. And if you look at their, uh, look at the finances of it overall, if you dig into all the corners where it's hit, they're getting about half of NASA's overall budget, about seven billion a year. Uh, there's some there's scientific return, there's technological return. But if you look at why the American public actually supports this and why Congress can go on voting money for it, it about two-thirds of the American public have polled thinks that, yes, space is neat, and we're doing it now, as a nation about the right amount of it. We're spending about the right amount of money. Mind, most of these people have no idea how much money we are spending or what we're spending it on, but they end up seeing on the evening news once a month or so that we're doing something neat in space, and they feel good about it, and they would probably be annoyed if their congressman voted to stop you things they see in the evening news. So the basic business NASA is in is producing neat TV footage that has us feel good as a nation. Uh, I, their secondary business is essentially white collar workfare in a number of key congressional districts in the country and, and a number of key overseas nations where they want to keep people from going to work in the third world building missiles. And we're all aware of that. But the fact is they're producing entertainment. This suggests a number of possibilities for private companies to compete. Because frankly, you can probably produce really good entertainment on people going into space and doing interesting things for less than seven billion a year. Uh, we haven't developed. Nobody, nobody that I know of has developed this thing beyond that. But we only came up with it about a month ago, so it's food for thought. Okay, where am I? My notes here. Check this out. Uh, as soon as we finish 
as soon as we finished our space access conference this year, we had to pack up our office and move it across town because our old land, our old landlord wanted to evict us on May 1st when our conference was finishing April 29th. We, we had a word or two with him to explain that that really wasn't going to happen. We, we were not just attending this conference. We were telling him about we were running it. As the people running the signal will, will agree that that's not the sort of thing you pack up an office a day afterwards. Um, anyway, the other, the other companies. Pioneer, as far as we know, doesn't, it doesn't have money to do significant hardware work. They're continuing to uh, refine their design in detail and are getting to the point where it looks, it's starting to look fairly solid. They're starting to get down to a lot of you know, minor aerodynamic details of various uh, aspects of their flight. Rotary, of course, did their flight tests last uh, summer and fall, uh, essentially low altitude landing mode tests. Uh, in case any of you weren't aware, they're planning on building a single stage to orbit vehicle and using essentially a jet powered helicopter blades to do the, the final approach and landing to give them you know, soft landing capability and some maneuverability for minimum weight. You know, they tested that part of the system successfully, flew the vehicle several times. This was essentially a structural test vehicle that had most of the composite structures of the complete vehicle. Then they essentially ran out of money, laid most of the people off. And, the, the remains of the company have been trying to get more money ever since. Uh, Universal Space Lines, uh, Pete Conrad's company, uh, can, you know, it contains much of the old DCX team. Again, uh, Bill Gobb asked for the DCX program and Jess Bond, who are both working out in Newport Beach these days trying to get funding. Uh, now, Kelly and Space Access LLC are taking a slightly different approach. They're actually they're, they're successfully pursuing modest amounts of NASA study money. Uh, this may or may not be a good tack in the long run. Uh, the, the downside of that is, is that it teaches them how to be a NASA contractor. The upside of that is it keeps the doors open until they can do something else. Okay, as far as the major companies go, our general impression, Lockheed Martin is not going to go ahead and do venture start commercially. X-33 seems to have enough technical problems that it seems unlikely on that basis. As Buzz Aldrin pointed out yesterday, the main reason the program hasn't been canceled so far is that the gentleman who stood on the stage while it was being announced in 1996 is running for president this fall. So it's very unlikely to be canceled before the election. After the election, as anybody's guess, that at that point it depends on how much the company wants to save face or continue to never buy time and there is a distraction. Uh, in terms of Venture Star as a generic name for some sort of reusable space transport, Lockheed Martin is still very unlikely to do it on their own dime. Because as, as they repeatedly said, uh, they have to pay something on the order of 20%. They would have to pay something on the order of 20% interest to, uh, to borrow the money to do it. The credit rating isn't that good at this point. The company has, has been in a bit of disarray. Uh, Boeing is in a position to do it on their own. Lockheed Martin has been pursuing the parole bill to get, essentially get government money to do it. Uh, Boeing is against the parole bill because they could technically do it on their own dime because they can borrow money at 7% because they're in much better shape. Uh, they don't particularly want to do it because why can people themselves? They already have an existing space launch business that's bringing in multiple billions per year in cash flow. Uh, why do something very risky that would, in essence, you know, compete with an existing business line of theirs that brings in billions of cash flow? This is a classic dilemma in transportation technological revolutions, by the way. Uh, the existing players almost never come out on top after a transportation technology revolution. If you look at, say, a, a sale to steam and ships or, or steam to diesel and locomotives, the old top players are selling the new top players because the old top players tend to stick with their existing investment far too long. Be that as it may, Boeing has no reason to upset the status quo until somebody else comes along and threatens it. Okay, I had to skip another page in my notes because the first pass wasn't going to be in anything like a logical order. Now, here we go. Now, this, this brings us to the government. This brings us to the government effort, uh, Space Launch Initiative. Well, there are two efforts, really. The one is the one NASA started about five years ago that's culminated in Venture Star. And, well, it's culminated in X-33 getting to where it has. And 
some minor projects like X34 and X37. I'm going to concentrate on X33. Uh, the general consensus seems to be that it's unlikely to fly. If it does fly, it's unlikely to fly well. The performance has dropped off. It's very unlikely to make the speed targets and make it to the Montana landing site they want. It's going to end up being single stage to Utah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not admitting this is public yet, except very obliquely. Uh, the senator from Montana is one of the key figures in funding him, and, and a photo opportunity standing by on the runway of Montana is one of the things he understood he was going to get about get out. But I think he knows better at this point. Nobody's admitting it public. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's, it's way over over schedule. It was originally supposed to fly about uh, over a year ago at this point. Uh, they're talking about two more years replacing the composite tanks with aluminum and so on, because they, they essentially managed to make positive tanks that were no lighter than aluminum tanks, and at the same time were <coughs> strong enough to stand up work stresses, which is a fair machine. Uh, at any rate, that, that program, that, that, that five-year process aimed at producing a national information and a national decision on reusable launch has led to a point uh, the conclusion NASA came to is that they want five more years and about three to three or four times as much money to try it again. Uh, they're calling it the Space Launch Initiative. Uh, something interesting has happened over last week. NASA this spring put out something called NRA 8 27, which is a solicitation for research proposals. Uh, they scrounged up about 17 million in research contract money for this fiscal year get the company started on a study and space launch initiative approach, which in general is to try to converge commercial and government requirements into a single program that would satisfy both NASA and U.S. commercial launch interests. Uh, what's happened is it's a very rapid-paced process. What's happened is, at least among the bidders, uh, a list of winners and by, by absence of non-winners is circulated. Something Buzz Aldrin completely referred to yesterday, apparently, that his company was not on the list of winners I've seen. They did bid. Uh, USL that has the DCX people, and once again, bidding a very modest uh, follow on to DCX five years later, still can't get even NASA study money to support it. Uh, Pioneer Rocket Plant was not among the winners. Uh, the, the small companies that did get on there were, were Kelly, who has been working. Space transportation architecture study process and a good NASA contractor. Sorry, Mike, I like Mike, but I have to say that. Uh, and Space Access LLC, no relation. Uh, and a big, uh, the, uh, the obvious companies that won, of course, the Boeing and Lockheed Martin, the science has got contracts. Uh, signs are that NASA is already narrowing down space launch initiative to essentially the people who are pursuing the path that they've laid out, the vision that they've laid out, and that space is going to continue. That concentrates on satisfying the existing commercial satellite market plus the existing NASA market to put a few dozen astronauts a year up to space station and a few cargoes. Uh, there's, there's no real provision within this process for studying the possibility of getting costs down to the point where the market you know, rapidly expands. We're trying to work this process. We're trying to get NASA to recognize that their, their basic assumptions aren't necessarily, that their basic assumptions stem from their needs as NASA and not necessarily from the actual commercial needs of the nation or the larger needs of the nation. Uh, wish us luck. The only good news is there will be some flavor of new administration in the White House a year from now that, for, uh, that may either want to try to distance itself from the existing policies or may just inherently want to have a whole new set of policies. We'll see about that. Uh, one thing we've been proposing, uh, we, we mentioned uh, trying, to, uh, trying to talk about this without uh, uh, trying to talk about uh, commercial space without talking about NASA, so like trying to talk about bananas while we're engaging on Gorilla and Corona. Quick word about the NASA decision making process and the internal consensus process NASA tends to go through before they arrive at policies that affect the whole agency. Uh, the best shorthand we've come up with this is about a thousand pounds of apes in a cage trying to decide where that bunch of bananas goes. Only, the, only, the only problem is one of those apes weighs 500 pounds. The whole human space enterprise is about half of NASA. 
as a significant political constituency, uh, as, a, as a significant and represents a significant congressional delegation. There's a lot of bureaucratic continuity and funding continuity, and it essentially is going to weigh in heavily on the side of institutional continuity for itself. Uh, any decision made NASA-wide about the future of uh, reusable space launch is going to be significantly affected by the needs of this community. The problem we see, the current process recognizes this in that it, it formally tries to converge commercial requirements and, and NASA internal requirements for reusable launch. The problem we see with this is that NASA internal requirements for reusable launch have, have some unspoken components that inevitably enter into this. Uh, one of them, uh, the, the primary one, is what we would call white collar workfare, uh, the requirement to keep something not too much smaller than the current workforce on payroll in the project. Uh, it's, it's a political requirement. It's, it's it's unspoken and it's very real. Uh, any, any plan for the future that calls for massive downsizing in any NASA center is, is very hard to sell. You you either have to be doing something new that keeps those people working, or in your incremental <coughs> upgrading of what they're doing, you, you can't afford to lay a whole lot of people off in one bunch. Uh, the commercial sector, meanwhile, can't really that sort of personal overhead. Uh, NASA needs you know, moderately cheaper rockets that lets them do moderately more. The commercial sector needs massively cheaper rockets that let them compete with overseas uh, competitors who already have inherently some of lower costs. Uh, they need to be radically cheaper than the overseas competitors in order to have the sort of edge they need to really grab back a lot of market share. Uh, we see these, essentially there's an incompatibility between the two requirements that means that any effort that, that is aimed at converging them, that is based on converging them, is likely to fail again. I think that's a significant factor in the Venture Star effort failing, the attempt to converge in convergible requirements. Uh, what we think is that NASA ought to split off a fraction of the available development money into a separate commercial support department that does relatively small, fast paced projects in support of commercial objectives, and that makes decisions about what those projects should be, in essence, behind some sort of firewall from considerations of what NASA's needs are. We have no objection to the majority of the available money going and support NASA's needs. That is an important national program and meets important national priorities. But we think commercial development should be done separately. At any rate, we're running short on time. I, as I make it, I've got a couple of minutes left. And I'd like to give you a chance to do questions. And if you give me a few questions, uh, let me just say that uh, private RLV Reports of its demise are grossly premature. It's alive, but it's changing direction. It's having to change direction radically to stay that way. Uh, we'll see where they end up in the next few years. They're going to end up in surprising places. You're probably not going to see the pursuit of regular commercial satellite launches as hard as they have, unless, of course, that market opens up again. Uh, with that, uh, gentleman over there. I understand that there's been somebody did a study it says that the, uh, the market for space access is up to a point at least price in Alaska. Yeah, uh, good, good point. Up, up until about 600 bucks, at which point the market does open up. So are the companies that are uh, looking at RLB right now getting too far up the line? They're not going to be able to get Yeah. You, you, you mentioned, the gentleman mentioned studies that have said that, uh, that, that demand for launch is fairly price inelastic until you get down to somewhere around $600 a pound cost. Uh, this is, in fact, one of the major reasons that proposals to do reusable launch vehicles in the near term tend not to make economic sense because your market isn't expanding that much and you're reducing overall revenue. And especially if you're already in the expendable launch business, you're, 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 losing, you're reducing the overall cash flow of the market. I believe, I can't remember the name of it, it was, it was a pan-industry study sponsored by NASA. Uh, Dana Andrews was talking about well, that. Well, commercial space transportation study. Yeah, CSTS, commercial space transportation study. Essentially, you have to get below oh, somewhere around $600 a pound before you really start seeing new applications come in and expanding the market. And the answer is that 
up till now, most of the startups were hoping to grab a slice of the market at above six hundred dollar a pound prices. They're hoping to compete. Uh, yeah, well, that's right? Pardon? Somewhere around one or two thousand a pound. Oh yeah, in the neighborhood of one. Well, if you ask them about price, they would say it's cheaper than the competition. Uh, there's a difference between price and cost. Their cost is they wanted to get down as far as they could. Their price they wanted to charge what the traffic would bear. Uh, you may see different goals. I don't know. More questions? Somebody else had their hand up earlier. Yeah, how's Bill doing? I've heard these testing the second statement, but I haven't really heard a whole lot about it. I haven't been following Beal that closely. Uh, they have the outfit that wants to build a multi stage pressure fed, uh, close to a classic big dome booster. It uses composite tanks, uh, pressure fed, hydrogen peroxide, and kerosene fueled. I believe they're going for a three stage, fairly low efficiency motors. They've tested their second stage motor recently, which is quite a large affair. Uh, as far as I know, the tests were successful. There were some stories that the performance might be a bit less than they hoped for. There might be some tinkering to do. Uh, I don't know a great deal more about where they are right now. I do know that FMC Corporation is now willing to ship you know, an industrial sized lots of high concentration peroxide. I suspect largely because Beal has been the launch customer for the get them getting their facilities up and running. So, but those of you who want to run your own liquid fuel rockets on uh, peroxide, you know, get 90% plus strength industrially instead of having to distill your own. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Essentially, the, you know, the Big Bigelow is one of the people who actually has enough money in his own pocket that he can afford to go with this and develop what he needs. Uh, I believe he's currently looking, working on uh, tourism, and there's a conference coming up in July out there on uh, large Man. I don't know a great deal of the details, but it's a little bit outside of my direct area of uh, expertise. But he is definitely a case of a man who's got his own money and isn't too worried about the commercial market, commercial market conditions he's going out to do what he thinks he needs and ought to be done. Any other questions? Okay, let me get in one more plug here. Uh, the Space Access Society, our website is www.space-access.org. Uh, we think that radically cheaper space transportation is a key prerequisite to just about all of the interesting things that, are, uh, that people are discussing wanting to do around here. And we run our annual conference in Phoenix area in the last weekend in April each year. Next one is Space Access 01 in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Holiday in Old Town starting Thursday night, uh, April 26th, and ending Saturday night, April 28th next year. Uh, to see some of you there. It's a very concentrated single track, two and a fraction day look at the current state of the industry. And by a year from now, we're expecting to see some interesting changes. So thank you all for coming. I'm only three minutes over my allotted time, so I'll put one not too far behind. And I want to thank Tom Jacobs and everybody who helped organize this. Oh, we've got one more question here. Oh, the website is www.space-access.org. Space-access.org. And it hasn't been updated since before our conference because we've been moving our office and getting ready for this conference. That'll be something new up there, buddy, up next week. No, it's, it's, it's a hype, a little dash. Okay, thank you all very much for coming, and I will turn the microphone back to our host here. Thank you very much.